looking for the silver lining to COVID, Danny? Okay, thank you. How's that? Can you hear me well? Okay, so managing parks in the 21st century, I thought this is a good opportunity to, to just reflect a little bit as a community. I think you're probably wondering, listen, three years on in a pandemic, are people still doing COVID talks? And yes, we are, um, but largely because we haven't convened here together. And, and I think it's important as researchers working in savannas and protected areas to actually really sort of reflect on the impact COVID has had um, in terms of wildlife, in terms of the people living around protected areas, and, and of course, in terms of the finances. I think, I think Lutando sort of did a little bit of an introduction into my talk, but I'll, I'll give, just drill down into a little bit more details. So in the early days of, of COVID in about April 2020, you remember you were here last in March, and some of you left here and became sick when you went home, and, and that was the start of the pandemic. By April 2020, the, the headlines were dominated by this amazing reset, nature's going to be reset and restored now that the humans went away and that humans are so very bad for the planet and nature. And so, so this was the anthropos or the nature reset or nature's healing itself. And, and reports of wildlife sort of were, were pouring in so much so that researchers were like almost frothing at the mouth. Oh, let's get in there. Let's do biologging data. Let's, let's collaborate. Let's sort of see all this amazing reset that's taking place. So, so now two years on, I think it's important to sort of reflect a little bit and what's, what exactly has happened. Um, and I think we've got to go back a step in terms, of, in terms of understanding this really sort of when I saw those initial headlines, it made me sort of really think about, um, about the Georgina Mace paper, because I think it, it echoed to me how our default thinking mode is this nature for itself. Nature doesn't need us. Nature would do better without us. We're just actually this cancer and this plague for the planet. And I think it's an unhelpful way to really sort of think, but it's, it, but it's so compelling and it's, and it's, it, and it's dominated mod modern conservation movement uh, for the last 60 years. So, so if we think about that first line of, of the Mays paper actually talks about conservation biology is a mission-driven discipline. So it's often sort of subject to fashions and fads. So in April, there was a big fashion and fad. Oh, nature's resetting, look. Um, actually, humans are bad, you can see. They, once they go away, things start, start coming right. Um, good time we've added to these paradigms, but there's still a huge dominant paradigm around nature for itself. And you sort of, when I sort of see that nature for yourself, you can see David Attenborough, you know, interviewed there at Chernobyl and having all those wildlife recover into the mass sort of, you know, that we've left this wasteland, we've left and nature's taking it back. Similarly, you sort of see E.O. Wilson talk about half earth, just declare it and leave it and set it aside and it will come back. So is that helpful, really? Is mass annihilation of our species really the objective? And why has it become so sort of pervasive in, in the conservation sort of movement and, and environmental thinking? Um, so we added with time, and I think part of this is because We've got nice metrics for that nature for itself. We, you know, you can declare protected areas, area under formal protection. You can look at number of species that are, you know, making its way off the red list, hopefully. Um, and you can say, pat yourself on the back and say, yes, we're doing a good job. These other things, these other paradigms that have been added have not actually come with robust signs or metrics to measure whether we're good at doing it. So, and we're getting there, but it's slow. So what we added was nature despite people. So when we started realizing that you can't just set it aside, there's lots of threats. So we've got to address the threats. 
Um, so we added nature despite people. And so addressing the threats of, and we started bringing in terms like minimum population, viability assessments, and all of those, those things, and, and uh, extinct, extinction threats and risks. And, but there was always people telling, pulling us back to the default thinking mode, which is, um, no, but you know what? Actually, just leave it aside. Just leave it aside, and nature will come back. Uh, when we added different components to that paradigms around the third sort of era of 2005, and remember those those first two paradigms dominated the first sort of six, the first sort of uh, 30 years, and then in the next five years we started thinking after the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, we started really thinking about about this idea of ecosystem services. But then there were the skeptics again. No, but this is now like commodification of nature. This is not good. Um, and so it kind of brought us back to nature for itself. So it's always, it's always this battle in our head because the human condition and environmentalists often feel we're the problem. Humans are the problem. Um, and then later on, more recently, we sort of added this people and nature, right? Nature needs people, our institutions, our cultural systems to actually thrive. Uh, but this one's newer and it's hard because we don't know, like, what do you measure? Well-being of people, happiness measures, it all seems so fluffy and, and it's hard to measure. So, so we still, the force is strong with that one. And you see it with the COVID early sort of, um, the way in which COVID was framed. So, so the first scientific papers that came out told us that there's some amazing responses in nature now that people went away. And so we've got clean beaches, we've got decreased nitrogen oxide, we've got, uh, uh, you know, for the first time people in Delhi are seeing the Himalayas. This is brilliant, brilliant. Um, and, and that, but then they were at the same time warning, but don't ever forget that there's huge amount of human suffering associated with this, so we must be cognizant of that. But actually later, we, as it played out, um, there was lots of sightings coming in from all over the world, animals in places they normally weren't. Um, nobody really asking, so what is that animal doing there? And does it really sort of, is it going to benefit a penguin to walk down Simon's Town? So, so, when the, so let's really look at the data and the impact it, that's sort of um, been found. So one of the big things that happened in COVID was massive scale collaboration. So scientists from all over the world pool biotagging data together. There was big, quiet ocean experiments. There was, there was um, so much of goodwill in terms of scientific collaboration. People got ownership rights, they got standardization of data um, so that they could make sense of what was, what was, how was the world responding in terms of what was wildlife, how were wildlife responding? And so 247 species changed their distribution in abundance and but the picture wasn't that first picture. The picture was a lot messier. And it was hard for people, especially the popular media, to make sense of it. Because in the end, it turned out to be a complicated story. There were winners and losers. And that even when we looked at urban wildlife that largely responded and you know, ended up in our backyards and in our streets and parks, that actually there were winners and losers. So some, some wildlife actually um, you know, had access to new resources for the first time. They, they uh, had less uh, competition with domestic uh, animals. Um, there was a reduction in roadkill. That was the sizable reduction because, of course, when you take out 41% of your vehicle traffic, road traffic, you end up getting a 42% reduction in roadkills. Um, there was less pollution of parks and beaches. But then on the same, on, the sort of, on, on an alternate sort of um, side, there was a lot more PPP, PPE and, um, and plastic pollution from all of our now needing to protect ourselves against COVID. Um, and there was also lots of disturbance in the green space where humans now flock to. Um, and then in terms of broadly, in terms of wildlife, there was, there was, some, there was also some um, some improvements and some, some winners. The winners, I think rhinos and cougar were a winner. So we got a poaching pause and, and what it told us is, no, we can't close the parks of all people and visitors, but when we have absolute control about who enters and leaves, we are able to actually sizably decrease uh, the level of poaching. Um, 
What we also saw is that there was increased <clears throat> breeding success, so beach closures in, in Florida were a great example where there was a 39% increase in, in breeding success of loggerhead turtles. Uh, there was a 12% decrease in ocean fishing, but there was a subsequent sort of increase in subsistence inshore fishing. So as people lost jobs, they were furloughed, they became more dependent on natural resources, so some inshore fishing increased. So ocean noise decreased, and I think this big whale report that came out now has been one of the great sort of products of COVID and collaboration. We now know where all these mega highways of whales and how can we change our shipping routes so that it's cognizant of where these animals choose to use the routes they use. Um, but by and large, most of it was mixed. It was, it was noisy. And, and because of it, I think a lot of us have not really sort of, really sort of understood, you know, has the effect been positive or negative? Great sort of, um, the PAN group had put together a really nice sort of assessment, 350 author paper, and, and really sort of tried to understand what was the effect size. And generally, the effect size was balanced. There was positive and negative, and, and that actually, it's the jury's out. COVID didn't have a positive impact as such on on nature or on wildlife. In terms of people, um, so, so the important thing about the wildlife, the reason this, this, this effect came about is because humans are not just threats to wildlife. Humans are also custodians of wildlife. And so that is, and those, and those factors actually balance each other out. So in terms of people, it's interesting because there was, there was two pandemics experienced. The first pandemic was the pandemic which was experienced in the Northern Hemisphere. They experienced a pandemic which was an acute respiratory illness. In the Southern Hemisphere in the developing world, we experienced a long chronic pandemic which is continuing. It's expected in the next year 400,000 people will die in Sub-Saharan Africa because of TB and access to medication. So people couldn't, these restrictions that were imposed by governments prevented people to access healthcare, food, water, clean water and sanitation, and really impacted and will continue to impact the areas around protected areas. There was a lot, about, there was a lot of economic insecurity around protected areas, around a lot of our reserves. People lost jobs. They were furloughed. They lost jobs. A lot of people left their economic hubs in Joburg and came back to rural areas. There were greater pressure placed on natural resources around protected areas. In some parts of, 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 um, of Africa, in Uganda, they found that there was a definite increase in snare poaching uh, and, and deforestation. So, so there was a lot of economic circumstance on people and people living around protected areas which had impact then on, on the protected area. There was a, in, in Kruger, there was a decline in conservation community levy um, because of tourists, not here. There was also decrease in community programs in a lot of protected areas around, the, around Africa and access to education dwindled. When, when schools in the developed world move into, into the digital space and virtual teaching, we didn't have options. So, so children just didn't go to school. And we start to see it already in terms of early literacy levels in grade one. So, also, human-wildlife conflict attacks. Um, there was increased shark attacks in Australia. So when humans also um, stopped the provisioning, certain sort of impacts occurred in terms of these animals became then um, dependent on food, and so there was a lot of animal attacks. Um, and then, of course, we became quite aware that people are People need green space. In the Black Forest in Germany, people were illegally camping because they needed to access natural resources and, and wild spaces. They don't have camping in the Black Forest, so people illegally camp there. So in protected areas, in terms of if we look at the finances, so tourism all but shut down, and a lot of protected areas were dependent on international tourism, so all funding to protected areas stopped. As a result, a lot of conservation programs were impacted, alien clearing programs were impacted, and even in sand parks where we were able to, to stay afloat and still continue to fund our conservation, it was largely driven by this inter scientists getting together and sort of calling governments out for bailouts for conservation areas. We talk about good green jobs, but we need to support them when these black swan events take place. 
So in terms of tourist numbers, I think Lutanda mentioned it, it briefly, we had major impact on our, on our tourist numbers. Uh, we were lucky in 2019 in the red is that we actually then had government bailouts. Government responded, they, they helped us. But then in 2020, they told us, you're on your own now, deal with it. So, and that's been harder because even though our numbers have, have come back, our revenue hasn't. And that's largely because we've become very dependent on international tourists and conservation fees from those international tourists. In South Africa, our ratio is one to four, but in countries like Kenya, their ratio is one to 10. So every sort of park entry fee for a, for a local is 110 here and 410 for, a, for, a, for an international. So we've become majorly reliant on, economic, on, on international tourists. So in the end, when we talk about when we talk about, uh, I'm going to steal two minutes. <laughs> so, from Sam's presentation. <laughs> so, when we talk about the sustainability, that it's tourism and it's, and it's, um, it's uh, people and it's conservation together, we're actually hiding behind the fact that all of that sustainability is largely dependent on tourism. It's driven by tourism. 82% of our income for our parks come from tourism. 70% of our revenue comes from two parks, Table Mountain and Kruger. During the COVID, impact, COVID uh, pandemic, Table Mountain went from 100, rand, 100 million rand profit to hundreds of thousand rand deficit. So our entire park establishment was being run of one park, essentially. So there's some lessons in this, right? And so some might tell you the lesson is, let's do more tourism, let's do, stop hunting, let's stop doing every other type of land use and just more tourism. And that's the wrong response. We should be learning from this. We've become too reliant on international tourism and conservation is not being funded through very, too, too diverse means. We need to sort of realize that humans are, are not just threats. We have to find solutions that actually, that humans become part of the solutions for this, for this nature protection and conservation. Um, we need, our, our socio-ecological systems need to be resilient because in its resilience, we're actually able to positively impact our natural world. And we need to, um, we also need to sort of really sort of start to diversify funding streams. Um, so in the end, this nature and people is not so different from the nature for itself because it's largely dependent on people's hopes and desires for the environment in which they live and that that they wish to leave for their children. Thanks. Thanks, Danny. Our next speaker is Sam, who is shortchanged by two minutes. Um, a big, hairy, scary policy. Thanks, Sam. Oh, sorry, before Sam, uh, take another minute. I was told that um, there are two very comfortable chairs here, so the speaker that's following on must please come and sit to take a seat here. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Navashni. Danny said, people and nature. Should animals and people have the same rights? Those of you that have got a yellow paper in front of you, you can write your answer there for me, please. We're going to need it a bit later. There's also other things that are important. Rewilding. You can also write on the yellow paper what you feel when you hear that. Welfare. What do you feel when you hear that? This is some of the things that South Africa is currently grappling with. And it's got a sort of a long history, but the more recent history it sort of started in 2018 when Parliament had a lion um, a colloquium uh, and it made a recommendation that government should review the, uh, the practices of, of lions in South Africa with a view to close it. Um, that was followed by a particular key court judgment that ruled that the way that lions are managed are actually impacting and your and my right to a healthy environment. And it led to the establishment of a high-level panel, and I think it was uh, a fairly, with fairly good intentions, I guess, um, with all those long lists of things that you're seeing on the side there as the kind of values that this particular high-level panel had to embrace. And I think there are a lot of really good things in there, some of the things I think Danny was reflecting on. Um, 
when they completed that, they made the high-level panel report available, and within days, there was a draft policy produced, put out for comment, and at the moment, South Africa is going through uh, a white paper uh, on sustainable use. So these sort of things, I think, are, are really important, and they were quite an aspirational vision that the high-level panel report provided for South Africa, with many elements in there. And I think for many people, uh, some of these elements may mean very different things. Um, but nonetheless, it had 78 recommendations and 187 actions. And several of those are very, very good. Two of those were particularly difficult because one of the instructions of the high-level panel was you should make consensus recommendations. And on two of those, they couldn't get consensus. So they reverted to a democratic process and voted and provided these sort of options. The first one was uh, really that all kind of captive breeding and use of any derivatives or derivables should be, should be stopped. The minority recommendations had various views of continuing with this and actually uh, trying to sort out uh, the particular um, difficulties that exist. It was primarily based on two aspects. One is that South Africa carries a major reputational risk, and the other one is that the current benefits that's associated with this is not equitably shared among South Africans. The trouble is, in 2018 was the last time Brand South Africa has actually done a survey about whatever reputational risk South Africa has got, and Lions never featured. The second point was associated with rhinos. And here there was a recommendation that more or less any form of non-wild rhino practices should be stopped uh, with the idea of creating the sustainable um, uh, conservation outcomes. It wasn't particularly clear what that was meant and what other kind of things that people are thinking about. The opposite choice in this democratic process was well, let's keep on doing these sort of things, use whatever we can around rhinos, particularly if we can use this to enhance some of our local people and the difficulties they've got with transformation. One of the difficulties with that is that the industry is not particularly well known for reaching out and transforming. So why would it all of a sudden happen now? So this is some of the difficulties that I think realized out of this process. Despite all those things, the policy had some very aspirational aspects. So South Africa's draft policy on managing elephants, rhinos, lions, and leopards, that was the four species, five species actually, because there's two rhino species. And it was really about facilitating the opportunities um, to enhance South Africa's socio-ecological resilience, particularly to try and contribute to fair uh, transformation and socio-economic development. The government received, according to some of the information that I got from government officials, 24,000 submissions. 8,000 of those were objections, apparently. We don't know how many of those submissions were from foreigners, and neither do we know how many of those submissions were actually from local people that are experiencing the cost of, of these big species next to us. But even more important is that the subsequent um, gatherings and, and meetings that government set up with stakeholders, particular stakeholders uh, that are managing these particular species, was met with quite a bit of aggression because it was all set up, how are we going to implement these recommendations? So the outcome is that currently there is a fairly large distrust among stakeholders in the South African landscape around these particular four species. The question is how the hell did we get there? to that sort of space, given the history that we've had. And perhaps some of the things that certainly Danny, and myself, and Janetta has, has thought about is maybe there are some things that are flagging some things about governance processes. And when you look at some good governance criteria, they very typically have got sort of four broad areas. Recognizing the rights of people, being lawful, being responsible, and if you get all those things right, you may actually be effective. And what we hypothesize or think is that some of these things fail because, first of all, we didn't recognize the rights properly. We have got some ideas about compassionate things, welfare aspects. I'll talk to you very shortly. There are some conceptual challenges. There are some factual risks. And in the end, there may also be pragmatic risks. All right. 
Those that's got yellow pages, do you want a flag for me then? That if you've written something on it, can you lift it up? Nobody's written anything on it, they don't know. Okay. What did you write, Lawrence? Well, you know, he's always got a condition. Okay. Now, those of you that don't have any yellow papers, don't worry. You just can accept what, Robin, what Lawrence has just said. Okay. So, guys, you've just experienced what more or less all of us have experienced. When you think about what meaningful engagement means, it's really about those stakeholders which will have the biggest impact. Whatever you're doing, okay? It's not a consultative process. The consultative process here was write for me, please, what you think about animal rights on a paper. Okay? And then I informed the rest of the people. So when you look at that little graph on the right-hand side, that was actually done in 1969, the ladder of, of community participation. And in fact, you probably agree with me that what you've just experienced is right in the middle of that ladder. You've had some consultation and you've been informed, and I probably have to go placate some of you at the end of this meeting somewhere with a beer. And I think this has been some, at the heart of some of the challenges that we are facing. One other thing is, when we ran into a problem with these contentious issues, we replaced and we asked 30 or 40 people, like we've had in this room, to vote for us on an aspect that's going to affect millions of South Africans. We've replaced consensus approaches, which are really strong in conservation, with selective democracy, if I can call it that. So I think these are sort of things that are really imposing some risks. And we see it when we start talking about some of the other things. Like, for example, the one welfare concept is a really useful concept, and it particularly focuses on the welfare of both animals and people within the context of the environment in them. Yet the policy focuses largely just on animal welfare, you know. So maybe we're back at that uh, basic uh, um, first uh, paradigm that Danny was reflecting on. And I think in the process we end up losing opportunities with other things like what, for example, what One Health and all these other kind of concepts may propose to us or, or provide us. There's some conceptual risk also. I'm not sure if any of you have written anything about what rewilding means, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be a hell of a lot of different views in this room. Uh, and I think it also re it removes us with some possibilities. I mean, one of the things that we're certainly realizing is that in, in future, we may have to think very carefully about how we can utilize novel ecosystem concepts and all these kind of things that can really help uh, contributing to things that are important to us. The particular policies were very, very good on, on describing thriving populations of animals. But there are other concepts that are use, more useful for us. If I have thriving people and thriving nature, I can go beyond just sustainability. And why is sustainability a problem? Because sustainability means I've got a really bad current ecological system and I'm just going to maintain it. I don't want to improve it. Whereas these thrivability concepts really gives us good opportunities to actually think about it. So I think there's wonderful opportunities that this kind of process can create for us, which we're perhaps not exploiting. There are some factual risks, and I've just grabbed some examples. I'm not going to go through all of them. But the reality is that in a number of these cases, the actual evidence that's out there um, actually contrasts some of the statements that's made in there. None of this is referenced, so it's very difficult to see where these things are coming from. Um, but I think one of the other major risks that we have in these complex societies, and Danny has also highlighted that, is when we conflating issues or concepts. If I'm conflating animal rights with welfare, for example, if I'm conflating two rhino species, how you manage a black rhino versus a white rhino is entirely different requirements on how you think a little bit about it. And even how I'm conflating some other aspects, like for example, the contentious issues around rhino horn and ivory trade. They are two different commodities with entirely two different drivers. So I think then, then the challenge really comes to and how do we ascertain the problems and, and make the linkages that if, if I do a particular policy in a way, X way, I'm going to have Y outcomes and so forth. The last little bit that was, was particularly risky is also some of this really pragmatic and practical risks. Um, you know, it's really good to say this, let's disinvest in, in, in intensive approaches. Um, and that's quite challenging. I mean, how the hell do I get rid of all of a sudden of 8,000 lions? You know, uh, and what sort of reputational risk goes with that if we start doing that. 
Um, but I think most, opportunity, most important is that there's some opportunities lost. There are several species which have done very well in terms of how uh, people have managed to actually recover them from virtually nothing. Um, there are other aspects which are really philosophical uh, and that has got big impacts on South Africa. For example, a moratorium on, on sustainable use of some of our assets actually directly contrasts some of our constitutional rights that we have and so forth. So these are sort of really difficult things. Uh, and even in our own current policies, like for example, the elephant research strategy that, that South Africa has got, we are pretty cognizant of the various scales and different things and what opportunities they can create for you, but also what kind of risks they can, uh, they can um, provide for you. So Madam Chair, I, I want to conclude. I think, I think we, we have a wonderful opportunity, but at the moment we may actually fail on achieving the, all the benefits that we can get by thinking about South Africa's amazing biodiversity richness. And part of it associates with us not complying very well with some of those critical governance criteria, most likely associated with having real meaningful participation. Uh, I heard you all, those of you that didn't have a yellow page in front of you, really cringing. So you're feeling that, and I think South Africans as a whole should be feeling that uh, when you are talking about our biodiversity. And Perhaps you should rethink this process, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, this is what we embrace. Adaptive management is not just adaptive management in the science way. It may also be adaptive management in how you set policy together. You know, so we shouldn't be scared and say we've learned quite a lot of very really good things out of this process. How can we improve on the things that we have learned, uh, etc.? cetera? And, and importantly, in future, these kind of things, when we make major changes, certainly we will need to know what the scenarios will be for us to go. So, Madam Chair, I do think that we have a great opportunity that if we can put processes together that comply with these good governance criteria, that we can achieve the outcomes which we want to achieve, and that is highly, highly effective biodiversity conservation in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Um, I think... You're going to be owing lots of beers tonight, so because you didn't take consensus. But there is time for one question if someone would like to ask. I think they're waiting for their beer. It's fine. Thanks, Sam. Uh, our next speaker is Dan Parker, and he'll be talking, it's quite a long title here, but Animal Welfare Considerations for Using Large Carnivores and guardian dogs. <laughs> Thanks, I'll leave that to you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks very much, uh, Navashni, and afternoon, everybody. Um, today I'm going to uh, give a brief presentation on some work that we did uh, not that long ago, so hopefully I can still remember it back in uh, 2019. Um, if you're interested in reading the paper or finding out more about how we did what we did, um, fairly uh, complicated assessment that we did in the end, um, the DOI for the paper is there for you to have a look at and uh, go and read up for your quiz later on. So, in addition to the killing or consumptive effects that predators have on their prey and their conspecifics, there are also a suite of non-consumptive effects, most notably the predator's ability to instill fear in other animals. And this concept, I think, is, is quite nicely illustrated in this short video. So things happen when we, we get a fright or we're scared. Significantly, though, the introduction of several predator species into pastoral settings, including guardian dogs, as non-lethal alternatives to protect livestock from predation is relatively common worldwide and is routinely assumed to be a superior method to some lethal alternatives. However, the animal welfare effects or impacts of predator and guardian dog introductions on the mesopredators that uh, the livestock are supposed to be uh, protected against have never been assessed, and this is where our study comes in. So in our study, we determined the animal welfare harms associated with a range of lethal and non-lethal 
predator management strategies that are used to protect livestock. We were particularly interested in the welfare harms associated with the, I've got to stop looking at that light, at the introduction of uh, livestock guardian dogs and an apex predator, in this case, the leopard, as you can see by the little um, icons over there. Our assessment considered anim animal suffering in two main domains, the period prior to an animal's death, i.e. the chase, and this is represented on the y-axis in the figure, and how the animal died, or in other words, the mode of death, and this is represented on the x-axis. The graph is also color-coded, I apologize to those of you who are colorblind, with greater animal suffering depicted in orange and red. So what we were able to do is we were able to demonstrate that by introducing livestock guardian dogs or an apex predator or apex predators as a potential pred predation management tool, this can actually result in significantly greater animal welfare harms compared to several other common and in some cases lethal alternatives. And in fact, both the use of guardian dogs and leopards scored the same, as you can see by the blue square over there on the figure. So our study shows that natural predation, i.e. being chased and killed by another predator, quite obviously has uh, animal welfare impacts. In addition, the landscape of fear that is created by the introduction of either livestock guardian dogs or leopards can potentially result in compounded welfare impacts, such as a loss of fecundity. Finally, depending on the context, lethal predation management tools can potentially be more humane than some non-lethal alternatives. So in closing, I'd just like to do the usual, as I'm sure most presenters do, the usual PowerPoint karaoke. Consider this statement from an animal welfare perspective. Is dying from poison over several hours a better welfare outcome than being repeatedly chased by a predator over many months, or in some cases, years, or being displaced and forced into starvation or conflict with your conspecifics? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Time's out. Our next speaker is Vanessa Dutte, and she'll be presenting on the dehorning controversy. Thanks, Vanessa. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to present to you a, a comparative spatial analysis on the effect of dehorning on black rhino home rangers. So as you all know, black rhinos are critically endangered and only 5,500 individuals are left. This mainly due to the current poaching epidemic, which to mitigate this, uh, two strategy, the main strategy is to increase risk and reduce reward for poachers. And this is done by a combination of anti-poaching and dehorning. So now dehorning is very common, but actually we're not really sure about its true efficacy on reducing poached animals, but also on its actual effect or impacts, potential impacts on black rhino biology. So there's quite uh, different views around dehorning and not much literature, but it has been reported that calves with hornless mothers have a lower survival rate Frequent sedation has a negative effect on female fertility. The effect, but then yet, effect the, of dehorning showed an increase in the in uh, population in Zimbabwe. But then horn size is related to to dominance, and but at the same time, dehorned animals retain range and dominance. But most of this is either disputed or based on insufficient data. So in 2011, Lindsay and Taylor reported that um, we it was required to, um, further studies were required to identify social impacts of dehorning with more sites and larger data. 
We also know that home ranges are strongly influenced by social interactions and structured by competition for mates in space. So this led to the question, does dehorning black rhinos alter home ranges? We put together a little comparative home range study with black rhinos dehorned and animals that had never been dehorned. This involved many populations, so a large number of animals in different populations, but importantly, with varying habitat, reserve size, dehorning regime, and period, or timing. So the study sites were across northern KZN mainly, and involved 10 different reserves with different populations, and with different dehorning regimes. So the data set was put together with, based on continuous monitoring data um, with black rhinos that are identifiable. So with long-term long, uh, location data, long-term demographic data with date of birth, date of uh, death, cause of death, and date of dehorning for those who had been dehorned with the horn size. So this was on a time frame of 15 years with close to 25,000 observations and involved 368 individual black rhinos. So for each, so only animals uh, that had sufficient data that was continuous in time um, were retained for the analysis. And the, the, for dehorned animals, these sightings we, used, we made two periods, so before dehorning and after dehorning. We then balanced that data by random selection and calculated home ranges using minimum convex polygons and kernel density estimates. And then we compared these home ranges. So this is per an animal. We then later mapped in population interaction uh, networks through home range overlap. We did exactly the same thing for control animals, so animals that had never been dehorned, except that we split their data, we just halved it, to have two different periods and compare those two periods, first and after. So with the mortality, so this is the start of the results. So for, this is just a quick, with, with the mortality data, over these 10 reserves, what we observed is that in time, so obviously the number of dehorned animals, the proportion, uh, increased, but then at the same time, mortality due to poaching decreased. But however, one must be cautious about this because these results are correlative, and this may be linked to other variables, and it's only across 10 different uh, uh, populations. So this could also be due to increased security in game reserves, so the reduction that we observe uh, with the mortality uh, due to poaching. Uh, lower economic incentives for poachers or even COVID lockdown regulations for 2020. And also, this is black rhino data only, not white rhino data, which often bear the, the biggest bulk of the poaching. So then for the results of home ranges, um, what you can see here for each of these little polygons is one individual rhino. So for horned animals, these are only horned animals, so the control group. The gray is the first period, and then either red or green is the second period. So red represents that they decreased the area of the home range, and green, they increased the area of the home range. So obviously the, the more darker, the bigger they reduced it or um, increased it. So then for dehorned animals, the same color code, and what you can see here is that there's just a lot more red than for the control group. So this showed that, actu that control animals had, um, had actually a tendency to increase their home ranges in time, whereas dehorned animals decreased them. Once they were dehorned, they decreased their home ranges, males and females. This is just a little illustration of one of the uh, reserve reserves of the populations of, of their home range shift in area, there's quite a big difference. So this, these, all these animals were dehorned, so before and after. Uh, we tested the treatments um, on, the, on the, the effect of the treatment on their home range. So this is dehorned or not dehorned. 
and sex, age, horn size as well. Uh, what you can see is that for the uh, control group, um, the the males had a so they had a tendency to expand their home range, and it was positive for males. For the dehorned group, there was no significant effect of uh, age, sex, or horn size, but they significantly uh, decreased their home range once they were dehorned. So for the uh, we mapped then the social interactions or a proxy to the social interactions. This is based on home range overlap. We only did this for a few of the reserves that had sufficient number of rhinos in both periods, so the same rhinos um, before and after that were dehorned before and after. And we grouped this, uh, there were inter interaction types, and so female, female, male, male, female, male. And for these three reserves, mostly they decreased the, the interactions. Uh, specifically, uh, male-male interactions were those that were affected most. And this is illustrated by this figure, uh, where before on the top row, there's a lot more connections than in the second row, where it's the connections and the, the density loss much more important than the top row. So what can we, what are the implications of this finding? Um, we know that black rhinos are agonistic animals and they use their horns for defense and offense. So is this potentially, uh, are they displaying avoidance due to loss of confidence without their main uh, defense? Um, so territory overlap is important um, for communications through dung heaps. So black rhinos would deposit dung in areas that are where they are very uh, most likely to encounter other black rhinos, and this is very important for in individual recognition. And so for social interactions, such as dominance, territoriality, and choice of mate. So potentially, this could even be affecting population structure, productivity, dispersal, and even translocations making it complicated. So the further steps of the study um, would be to improve these interaction networks, because this is based on sightings data, so it's not always very continuous, uh, and definitely not fine scale. So the best would be to um, use GPS uh, transmitters. We're actually currently trialing some horn caps, for dehorned animals are obviously more difficult, Rickett will tell you about it in, his, in the next presentation. Um, and we should consider looking at productivity. Um, this could maybe affect long-term uh, genetics, uh, and, and we, it, we could even see a, a shift in paternity after dehorning if this is affecting dominance. Thank you for your attention, and please feel free if you have any questions. Thank you, Vanessa. I think we have some time for <laughs> any questions, if anyone has. I think, no. Okay, at the back. Thanks. Just a question about, you don't think it's the actual act of darting and dehorning the animal rather than the fact that it doesn't have its horn? Have you considered capturing and darting um, animals that are not dehorned and adding that to your sample? Thanks. Uh, I mean, we, th this wasn't a focus, but I know it does happen. Sometimes uh, animals are translocated and they're not dehorned. And this is, this is a very, very, very large data set, so it definitely involves some of these animals. But mostly, um, yeah, it wasn't a focus, so it, it potentially. But as it's also long term, um, I think that maybe the darting, because some of these dehorning regimes is only every two years. So I would think that it's more the fact of not having a horn than that, but that's just a theory for now. Okay, thank you.
Then I think our next speaker is Ricketts that's going to chat to us about the horn cap. Thanks. Okay, this is the guy. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to continue where Vanessa left off. Um, so why did we investigate the use of, of horn caps on our rhino population? Um, obviously, we had a need to collect more accurate spatial data, but we are a bit worried about the po potential health um, impact that food collars can have on rhinos. Also, it's known that a collar sitting lower down on the ground is less effective than something sitting higher up just because of the disturbance of grass and so on. Um, and then obviously, yeah, as Vanessa said, our population is dehorned at the moment, so that rules out horn implants. Okay, so what we did is we set up a LoRa network across the reserve by erecting these base stations. Um, we use curling gateways. Um, that's a little white box sitting at the top, which has got a range of approximately 13 kilometers line of sight. And then, yeah, this is what the horn caps actually look like. I've got one here. Um, they were developed by Eich in Switzerland, and I went through a rigorous testing phase before we deployed them. They're constructed from um, a block of, I guess it's like a hard, pla hard plastic called POM, and it's was by laser engra engraved. Um, so, and they consist of, of three different layers. You've got the base at the bottom here, and the actual GPS unit sits in the top. And then the base is actually, it's got what you can call negative stairs, um, and it's sanded down, so the glue that we use bonds better with the unit. So we've got them set up at the moment to transmit every six hours, which should give us a battery life of approximately two and a half years. Um, and we also need to mention that it's got a proper GPS chip, so it doesn't use the triangulation from the base stations to get the coordinates. And if it's not in um, range of a base station, it can store the data up to 200 points. So the main skepticism or criticism of this whole project was whether this unit was actually gonna stay on a rhino especially because we use black rhinos. People thought that the moment the rhino crashes through a bush, it's just gonna come off. But we were using what's called Equilox 2, which is a horse hoof epoxy. It hardens within a minute or two, and it seems to be working really well. Okay, and I'm just gonna show a couple of pretty photos of what they look like with their nice new jewelry. Um, that one that's zoomed in a bit there, we actually changed the top part, which is a nice feature of these pods that we use. Um, if there is a problem, you can just take the top off. There's some more pretty photos. Okay, so how did it go? Um, we deployed 12 units in total in Itala um, through two different operations. In the first, during the first operation, we put seven on. Unfortunately, we had a bit of an issue of the software and we didn't get much data. And then the second operation, we put another five on. Again, we were a bit unlucky. Um, during the manufacturing process, someone forgot to sand the bottom units, so the glue didn't bond to the units, so they all came off almost immediately. But from the units that we put on during the first um, operation, most of them stayed on. The first one that came off only came off after six months, and most of the other ones stayed on for well over a year. So obviously as the horn grows back, the unit's gonna sit higher up and that's gonna affect how long it actually stays on. The higher up it is, the, the more chance there is of it breaking off. So we found that E-class animals are the best fit for our pods, but you can also, during the dehorning process, you can shape the horn base a little bit um, to make it fit better. So elsewhere in Kaiserin, um, Wildlife Act also deployed a whole bunch of units. They also had their own teething problems with um, on cap design and software issues and so on. But they've had units that have stayed on for 15 months and counting now, which is really doing well. Okay, so the way forward, we're planning on fitting another 30 transmitters later this year for Vanessa study. Um, there's a possibility of going satellite instead of using the LoRa network to transmit the data. Um, we might have different size transmitters so that you can put on younger animals and F-class animals as well. Um, we want to increase the number of fixes per day because even, even, I mean, if, if we're going to continue the awning every two years, you're never going to have a unit on for longer than two years, so you can just as well use up a bit more battery. 
Um, and then, yeah, we could possibly add other stuff to the unit, like accelerometer, to characterize the behavior during the time of transmission and so on. So yeah, just in conclusion, I think this has got major potential, these units, um, and it's something really to consider if you do need to collect more sp uh, accurate spatial data for rhinos. Yeah, that's it, thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Rickard. Your time is just out from the timekeeper. So if there's any questions, please get hold of Rickard. Our next presenter will be Reese Alberts, and he'll be chatting to us about environmental impact assessments, uh, their effectiveness in protected areas. Thanks. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you, Navashni. Yeah, amazing experience. Just uh, echoing the sentiments of some of the speakers this morning, uh, being in a face-to-face -face conference. I was told to dress, so Granddad's tweed jacket uh, came along. Mom, if you're on YouTube, I'm wearing the jacket. So just wanted to, just wanted to put that out there. Um, just also to acknowledge my um, colleagues in the crowd and uh, co-authors, that's Professor Francois Retief, Dr. Claudine Ruiz, and uh, Professor Dirk Salio. So, environmental impact assessment, if you say environmental impact assessment effectiveness, um, what are we on about? So, just a step back, um, our research group focuses on law and policy and governance. That's the, the muddy gut in which we play. And um, if you understand the, the legal and policy context within which conservation and biodiversity management happens in South Africa, there are three main approaches, um, market-based approaches, civil-based approaches, and of course, command and control. So EIA, environmental impact assessment, lives within command and control um, as a permit, as by Dr. Ferrara. It's, it's big, hairy, scary policy implementation in essence. So at the bottom of the screen, it's, it's the most influential person you've never heard of. That is Linton Caldwell. He's the father of impact assessment. And um, he sort of penned the inclusion, which was signed off by uh, Dick Nixon, New Year's Day, 1970. It formed the basis for impact assessment. It is arguably the most successful policy implementation instrument um, known to man. It's been adopted by all countries worldwide. Um, and the overall aim, in effect, is to inform decision making by proactively considering and predicting the consequences of our actions on the environment. South Africa has got a long love affair with impact assessment. Um, arguably, one of the most famous ones was 1993 with uh, the proposed mining in uh, St. Lucia at that stage. It was uh, considered groundbreaking work. Um, some good papers were written on that, and it sort of set the scene for the next 20 years of, of EIA. Now, why EIA within protected areas is important, it's dealing with those increasing pressures um, that protected areas are expected to meet. Um, these are other policy objectives, for example, socioeconomic development. We've heard a lot about that this morning uh, from the opening address, um, sort of resonating through some of the other presentations. And it's about balancing our environmental protection with socioeconomic development. And this is why the effective use of policy implementation instruments becomes so important. Now, within South Africa, as I've said, we've had it for more than two decades. Now, EIAs within protected areas are different from EIAs within other areas because of the strong focus on conservation and environmental protection. And the fact that these impact assessments are usually controversial. Um, they are sort of high profile, and they're often viewed with a lot more, more scrutiny than your box standard impact assessments. And the scale of developments that, that these EIAs deal with range from tented lodges, uh, safari camps, et cetera, to mining within protected areas, the Lowe's and BZK study coming to mind. Um, in terms of sand parks, just a quick browse on the website, gives you a list of about 18 or 19 uh, recent EIAs which have been done, this conference center being one of them, uh, the, the train on the bridge being another. So it is something that, uh, that we are confronted with quite often. Now, what makes the South African situation so unique is that when we deal with our international colleagues, they, they sort of fail to see the issue because EIAs are not done in protected areas in other countries. Within South Africa, we have a unique system where sand parks, Isambelo, Cape Nature, whoever the case may be, are beholden to the discretion and the decision and the regulation of Department of Environmental Affairs, uh, DMRE, if it's a mining application, or the provincial authorities. So it really is quite a unique, unique situation that we find ourselves in. And it, this just highlights the complexity that we deal with when you look at EIAs, uh, many line functions, many issues to, to align and to deal with. So what we did as a research group is we started by looking at the quality of these EIAs within our national parks. We took 24 developments within sand parks, 
and we scrutinized EIA quality. Now, EIA quality is not EIA effectiveness, but in essence, it tells us what the quality of the application was like, what the quality of the reports were like. It is important, but it does not tell us about the effect that the EIA has on decision making, because ultimately that is what impact assessment wants to do. It wants to influence the ultimate decision. It also doesn't tell us if the objective of the EIA has been achieved post decision making. So yes, the, the project was authorized, authorization was granted, but what happened after that? And Oskin and Strauss in 2014 sort of made the call for EIA effectiveness and um, more research in that, in that sphere. So EIA efficiency per se, not EIA quality is an is a international debate and it's a very important debate for us um, as, as scholars of impact assessment. So what, what do we mean when we talk about impact effectiveness? What is it all about? And it's Sadler in his seminal work in 96 which said, well, it's asking two basic questions. Is EIA working as intended? So is it doing what it needs to be doing? And is it meeting the purpose for which it was designed? He then broke it down into three components of effectiveness. And, and this is what we focused on in this particular research. We're looking at procedural effectiveness. So does the impact assessment process conform to the established procedural provisions and principles? Substantive effectiveness. So does the impact assessment achieve the objectives of EIA? Ultimately, is it supporting well-informed decision making? And then lastly, transactive effectiveness, asking whether the impact assessment process delivers these outcomes in the least cost and in the minimum time possible. And that brings us to the research that I'd like to present today. So this was published in um, the IIA journal. Aim of the paper was to apply 42 developed KPIs to certain EIA cases within protected areas to test um, the effectiveness criteria. The KPIs were the result of a presidential commission looking at the EIA system effectiveness for the entire country, and we were fortunate enough to be able to use those KPIs um, for this particular research. Sam mentioned theory of change in his presentation. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the, the KPIs were developed as part of a, a theory of change process, which asks very simply inputs, what do we need to do effective EIA in protected areas? What activities are we conducting in the EIA process? What are the outputs or what comes out of this process? In this case, it'll be EIA reports, authorizations, licenses. What are the outcomes? That is the, um, the what is the EIA actually achieving in the short to medium term and then obviously the impact long term. Are we, are we actually making a difference? This is the exploded view of EIA and um, the, the different system components. I don't want to dwell on that. 42 KPIs developed applied to several cases, and basically um, a conformance score was then issued, A, B, or C, and this is the result. If we look at the input components, so these are the inputs into EIA processes. This deals with skills and competencies, the people who are doing the reports, the, the EAPs, mind you, not the APES, even though we get called that quite often. Um, these specialists, the, the regulators, what are their skills, what are their competencies? And then, importantly, if we look at output, so these are the reports that come out of this EIA process. You'll see that there's a bit of a problem there um, in terms of output and substance. Specifically, when we look at things like significance, determining the significance of impacts, are impacts significant, how have they been rated, um, looking at mitigation, specifically looking at things like need and desirability, that is motivating the need for these developments within protected areas, and then also the consideration of alternatives. Um, are there any other alternatives that could be proposed? And we see quite weak scores there. So just to conclude and uh, basically wrapping it all up, so in terms of transactive effectiveness, there's no surprises here. EIAs in protected areas are expensive. They exceed um, the international threshold of 1% of total project cost. This is due to the remoteness of the locations, the um, sort of increased need for specialist studies, the sensitivity of the environment, and the uh, controversial nature of the development. In terms of procedural effectiveness, um, within the South African context and internationally, we do EIA well. We tick the boxes, we fill in the reports, we uh, keep to our time frames. So we do EIA well in terms of process. The problem is substance. And, and what, the, what the study found is that the substance is, is still lacking, um, especially in those areas as highlighted above. So how do we rectify this? Some recommendations are made. Um, 
the development of specific EIA guidelines for EIAs in protected areas. This was something that was picked up by the IUCN uh, during, uh, about two years ago, just before COVID started. That process has sort of unraveled or un unraveled a bit, ground to a halt. Um, I think because of the complexities around understanding EIA within protected areas in the different contexts, it's not easy to do that internationally. So we are proposing um, getting something done for the SADC region. region. Specific training for the guys who do these EIAs within the protected areas to make sure that they understand what context they're operating in. Perhaps looking at more flexible timeframes. EIA is a very rigid process. Um, it's got very strict timeframes and we feel that perhaps straight jacketing uh, these applications within those rigid timeframes is not doing justice uh, to the specific protected area context. And then of course looking at specific skill requirements. And that brings us to the ongoing research. Where are we? So, what we've determined through a series of three publications is that despite the fact that there is weak substance within our EIA reports, decisions still get made. So we are making correct decisions based on weak substance. And given the legal and policy context within which EIA operates, those decisions cannot be challenged if you look at the administrative justice principles within which the regulator takes those decisions. So in effect, we are getting legal EIA, procedurally correct EIA, implementing and having um, the effect of weak substance being included into, into our final decisions. And I'd just like to share with you some work that's also done by colleagues of ours, um, Professor Fonsho Atif, who's here as a, as a co-author on this. What we've basically, or what they've basically said is having a look at impact assessment and where it pitches within the ethical spectrum. Um, as with many of our policy implementation instruments, EIA leans towards the anthropocentric side of the spectrum. And that means that it is performing its function within the constraints of the political context in which it operates. It cannot reasonably be expected to do more. And what they found, and, and the caveat is that this is for EIAs outside of protected areas, is that there will inevitably be an incremental loss of biodiversity because of the anthropocentric and socioeconomic context within which EIA is expected to, to perform its functions and its duties. So I will conclude with this. Um, we are underway with a call for best practice principles for impact assessment within our protected areas. Um, the, the best practice principles, why do we need them? Well, we need to provide standards for practice. We need to increase our legitimacy, provide a basis for accountability, and provide inspiration for people doing EIAs in these areas. Developing them is not easy because it means we have to go back to our core values. And once we've sorted out our core values, we can sort of define certain principles and from principles, we can then draft these guidelines for, for impact assessment in these sensitive areas. And the final slide is we have a Google link. Any person who is interested in, in being part of the development of these best practice principles, you're more than welcome. I've, I've arranged with Jackie to, to share the link with you. The idea is to, um, first of all, develop these principles, but we need to get buy-in from relevant stakeholders. We need to get endorsement from industry so that uh, there's uptake with these things and that they do get implemented. And we foresee that it's a one-year project that's based on a specialist working group, max 10 members core group, but obviously anybody who, uh, who would like to be part of it will then form part of the, the periphery group and provide input into this. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you. I think you can wait up there. You've got uh, about two minutes if anyone has any questions. Thanks. And I think our last speaker for this afternoon will be Claudine Roos, and she will be chatting to us about actually understanding waste management behaviors, focusing on the private reserve next to us. Thanks. Thank you. OK, there it is. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, like was said by our chair. Um, I'm the last person standing between you and your beers with Sam. Sorry, Sam. Um, so the um, paper that I will be presenting this afternoon looks at understanding uh, waste management or responsible waste management, um, focusing specifically on understanding behavior. And we use the theory of planned behavior um, as the specific method or model to, to predict behavior. 
and this research was specifically done in the Sabi Sunfield Day. Okay, so um, like Rhys mentioned, we see increased developments uh, in protected areas, and unfortunately, these increased developments have negative or adverse impacts on these areas that we actually want to protect from these negative impacts. One specific concern with developments in protected areas is responsible waste management amongst others, but one that I specifically focused on is understanding waste management and responsible waste management. So rapidly increasing quantities of waste have or can have irreversible, um, cause irreversible damage to our natural environments and protected areas. It can impact on soil quality, air quality if we burn the waste, um, visual impacts, impacts on water and even on biodiversity. So responsible waste management is in protected areas is therefore essential to ensure that these areas remain protected and also to reduce negative impacts not only on biodiversity but also on visitor experience. Okay, so understanding the underlying factors that may influence or predict behavior is therefore important to move towards or to work towards responsible waste management in protected areas. So this brings us to the focus of this current presentation where we apply the theory of planned behavior to understand waste management or to predict waste management behavior in protected areas. We have used this uh, model elsewhere um, in other protected areas. One of our students did it in Olival Shoal Marine Protected Area. We are planning on rolling it out uh, in Itosha um, as well. Uh, but this specifically focuses on the Sabi Sant Viltain, which formed part of a bigger project where the Sabi Sant Viltain uh, developed an integrated waste management strategy for managing waste within the reserve. Okay, so what is the theory of planned behavior? It's a um, psychological theory which aims to predict persons' intentions to um, undertake specific actions or behavior. In this case, responsible waste management was our focus. And this theory suggests that intentions or intent to um, behave in a specific way are a function of several dif different elements, which include subjective norms, so that, that's our beliefs, our ethics, our morals, and what, what we believe is important or not, our attitudes towards a certain type of behavior, and then also perceive behavioral control. So that looks at uh, elements such as practicality, uh, cost, convenience, etc. Uh, the theory is very frequently applied in waste-related um, research, especially for household-related research. We couldn't find anything specifically done um, for protected areas in the South African context, but we developed our research in accordance with um, what's normally done in household um, surveys, and we adapted that to the protected, um, to, to basically be suitable to understanding waste management or responsible waste management in protected areas. Okay, so now looking at our case study, um, if you are interested in reading a bit more, um, this was published uh, last year, November, in the IUCN Parks Journal. So there we elaborate. We also did look at some of the statements, um, like the attitude and willingness and support statements, and how they, um, the associations between the different um, types of statements. So for instance, if someone has a positive um, attitude or if they support a specific um, intervention, how likely are they to be willing to conduct certain activities? So um, more about that, I just summarized the research findings very shortly here. So we developed, unfortunately it was, we, we commenced with the research um, right in the middle of the, the very strict um, lockdown in 2020. So instead of doing face-to-face uh, -face interviews, we had to rely on electronic survey questionnaires, which was found um, suitable. We had 40 respondents who participated in the research, which consisted of 11 members of the management authority of Sabi Sandviltain, 15 commercial properties or lodges, 
and then 14 non-commercial properties. Okay, although visitor experience or visitor behavior also plays a very important role, um, we could not interview or um, conduct surveys with any visitors at the time of conducting this research because there were no active visitors at the time of the research. So it's an area for follow-up work, definitely. So we used, um, we had specific statements that was based on the theory of planned behavior that looked at attitude, willingness, support, and we posed those statements and asked people to rank them using a Likert scale rating to indicate their level of agreement or their level of willingness to engage in specific activities. Okay, I already said that. We looked at attitude and subjective norms, so uh, is it an important, important part of the um, activities at the reserve? Does it form an important part of sustainable development, for instance? Do they support the development of an integrated waste management strategy? The strategy has the goal of coordinating waste management within the reserve, having common goals and objectives, and then also testing their intent or their willingness to engage in specific activities. So the intent statements or the willingness statements were not posed to the management authority respondents since the types of responses were already workshopped with the management authority beforehand and they already indicated their willingness to, to um, basically um, conduct all of the activities that we suggested. So now looking at our main findings, firstly at attitude, so it's um, when, where we see a five, it indicates strong agreement with a specific statement and where it indicates one strong disagreement. And what we did is, Per uh, respondent category, we calculated a mean Likert score value per specific statement. So if we firstly look at the beliefs or intrinsic factors, you will see that most or all of the respondents strongly agreed that responsible waste management is an essential part of sustainable development and also that it forms an integral part of the reserves activity. So very um, positive um, attitudes that we see over here. Then if we look at reciprocity, so that's peer pressure, someone expecting us to do something, all three of the categories also indicated that they believe that responsible waste management are expected by, by their guests. Okay, if we look at extrinsic factors, there's a bit of a, a, a mixed bag where um, we see that most of the um, non-commercial, sorry, commercial property and management re authority respondents agreed that responsible waste management um, can improve the, the image of the private nature reserve and also be uh, an important factor for the, the brand and marketing the brand. But that both of these respondent groups were very sensitive towards um, cost and effort that could be associated, still not negative, please um, see that they were either neutral or partially agreed um, to the statements. And they were also um, concerned or sensitive towards the um, convenience of the guests and influencing the ecotourism experience through the waste management measures that may be proposed in the strategy. Okay, so if we look at attitude, mostly all role player categories reacted positively and had positive attitudes towards uh, waste management, beliefs and in intrinsic factors such as moral norms and inner beliefs dominated their positive responses, and reciprocity also played an important role towards uh, positive attitude responses. Extrinsic factors like, such as cost and convenience of visitors were a concern to the management authority and also to the um, commercial property respondents. Okay, now if we look at the support statements, you will see most of our uh, respondents strongly supported um, the development of an integrated waste management strategy for the private nature reserve. All of the management authority respondents um, supported the, the development of such a strategy. Most of our commercial um, properties or lodges also supported it. 
And then um, if we look at the non-commercial properties, also largely support. There was only one person um, who said that they did not support the development of an integrated waste management strategy. We didn't ask why, so we don't know why, but uh, only one person. Lastly, willingness. So this is specifically willingness to engage in um, specific waste management measures. So firstly, um, remember that this only shows our commercial and non-commercial properties. The management authority was not included in this part of the survey. If we look at um, the non-commercial properties, the first two red dots that you see on the screen, um, although we, they were not unwilling, if we see, where's the laser? One means unwilling, so they were either neutral or they were willing to partially um, or under certain conditions engage. So um, allocating human resources towards waste management and also avoiding the purchasing of non-recyclable materials, um, they, it scored a bit lower with the um, non-commercial properties and then in line with the findings that we saw under the attitude statements, the commercial properties were reluctant to require their visitors to separate waste at source. Uh, one of the speakers mentioned this morning, um, Sabi Sunfilter, and if we look at the um, commercial lodges, mainly high-end lodges, so we can understand that we don't want to impact too much on the visitor experience by requiring um, specific waste management measures. Then, um, both of the role player uh, groups were very um, supportive or very willing to support um, local community uh, projects, education and awareness programs, and also to acquire basic infrastructure for the separation of waste at source, etc. Okay, so um, I think we, we, uh, we saw that both of these role player prop role player categories were willing to engage in responsible waste management measures. Um, we, we saw reluctance of the non-commercial properties, although maybe a red is a bit um, uh, like sending up flags here, maybe it can just be a lighter green. They were a bit more um, sensitive towards allocating human resources and avoiding the purchasing of um, non-recyclable materials. The commercial property respondents were sensitive towards requiring guests to separate their waste at source. Um, also linking with the earlier mentioned attitude statement where they were sensitive towards influencing visitor experience. But all role player categories strongly supported community involvement in waste projects, education and awareness programs, and also the acquisition of infrastructure like bins to separate waste at source. So in conclusion, um, since intrinsic factors or intrinsic behavioral elements are very difficult to change, it's difficult to change how, how someone feels or sees waste um, as a resource or as something that has no value, since those are difficult to change, the role of extrinsic factors as external incentives in um, waste management should be leveraged. So we should look at, if we look at waste management measures within protected areas, how can we focus on these um, extrinsic uh, factors? This may include um, improvement or, of brand or image, marketing value, international recognition, uh, improvement in um, community relationships. There's many that we can, that we can um, mention. Creating awareness amongst the different role players uh, about the benefits of sound or responsible waste management, whether it's environmental or financial, or it has an economic role, um, should, should um, be highlighted because this may increase support or buy-in into responsible waste management measures. And then lastly, the role of education and awareness. Um, should not be underestimated. We didn't really look at education and awareness as a specific element over here, but research shows that it plays an important role. Okay, just the last slide. We are busy with some follow-up research, so um, I'm not presenting it here today, but in um, 
exactly a year ago, we um, had the opportunity to do face-to-face -face interviews with our survey respondents to focus on opportunities and challenges for waste management within protected areas. So um, hopefully we can present that in future. And then also similar to what Rees has mentioned, is also to look at some sort of a guideline or best practice for waste management within protected areas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Claudine, for the presentation. Okay. Oh, they are for this session, there are two posters that we have outside. And please have a look at them, one by uh, Norman Owen Smith, Only in Africa, The Ecology of Human Evolution. And then another one by Graham, and that looks about sustainability of the Southern African ecosystem featuring the Under the Space Two program. So please, can you have a look at those uh, posters? The last announcement, thank you for, first of all, staying through the session. And I think there was an announcement that dinner tonight will be at the Skukuza Golf Club. And if anyone doesn't know where the Skukuza Golf Club is, uh, Jackie will have, or there's a map there that can direct you how to get from the rest camp to the golf course and back. Thank you very much. Mayplant.